Hey there, I'm Dr. Amy King, otherwise known as Dr. Amy, and this podcast is the most important medicine. If you're a physician or healthcare provider, this podcast is for you. This is where we learn about trauma-informed medicine and ways to build resilience in patients and healthcare organizations. We do this through listening to your stories, and stories of other professionals and patients. And we transform medicine with compassion and curiosity about what it means to be a trauma-informed practice or provider. Every time you join me, I want you to hear practical information and leave with tangible tools you can use with patients right away. So today I am so excited. I'm here with a special guest, Dr. Miriam Silberglate, otherwise known as Dr. Z. So that's what, <laughs> that's what we're gonna be. <laughs> Miriam is a triple board certified physician in internal medicine, geriatrics, and obesity medicine. She's completed a physician leadership, oh, she has completed a physician leadership academy and a fellowship on leadership development and education through the AAMC. And she is certified as a mental health ally and wellness advocate. She serves as a member of the American College, College of Physicians, National Wellness and Professional Fulfillment Committee. And she is the author of the book that we'll talk about called The 3G Cycle of Life, The Secrets of Achieving Joy, Meaning, and Well-Being. Welcome, Dr. Z. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much for inviting me and um, hello to everybody. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you. And just so everybody knows, um, where are you Zooming in from today? And, and what's, what, how else would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> so I am here in Miami, Florida. Uh, we just survived uh, Hurricane Ian, so... Uh, crossing fingers that everybody else is safe and healthy right now. Um, and who I am, uh, a mom of two amazing boys that drive me crazy and they are very delicious. Uh, a wife, a daughter, a friend. Yes, a physician also and an advocate. Uh, but I believe that I am a woman and I am a human being and that's exactly uh, what represents me and what represents what I am doing and what what is my purpose in life. Oh my gosh. I I wish everybody that introduced themselves introduced themselves that way, right? Just their whole self. Because Uh, because we are a whole, right? Um, And that's something that it took me a lot to learn, um, especially as a physician, a type A personality, workaholic, and all these uh, titles (laughs) that I got through through the years that... um, you know, that are not necessarily something to be proud about. Uh, We go to medical school or to many other careers thinking that we are the certificate that we get on our walls, right? And the truth is that, no, that is just our job, uh, like any other, like that is our function in society, but that's not who we are. And I learned that several years ago when a couple... I used to come to visit me as patients uh, when I was in Peru. I am Peruvian. I am a Latin girl. Um, uh, they, they used to come every two months or three months. And every time they would be asking me if I got married <laughs> or if I am dating someone, <laughs> my answer will be like, I am too busy. I am a doctor. And uh, one day they told me this, showing my white coat, uh, this is what you use, this is just clothes. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is not your skin. This is what you do, not who you are. And uh, I keep that in my mind since then because sometimes it's hard for us to recognize that sometimes we are losing our identity as human beings Mm -hmm. and we are just adopting the identity of, you know, the clothes or the job that we are using. The white coat, yeah. Oh, white coat is very heavy to use. <laughs> oh, it's very heavy to use. And I love a couple of things you've said. We're more than our certificate. And our job is what we do, not who we are. Um, yeah. how, how were you trained in terms of being your whole self and being a human being? Like, were you, were you taught that? Was that, I mean, you're triple board certified in, in three different specialties of medicine. In, in any of those, were you... No, you're shaking your head. No, okay. <laughs> no. Uh, the truth is no, uh, and I am. I, I am more than 
triple board certify, uh, and I'm not saying this uh, in order to, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> be, be uh, kind of like, I don't know, to, to feel very proud of this, uh, about this, it's actually the opposite. I even trained in Peru and I practiced in, in Peru medicine for 10 years. So, so I went through a lot of training, <laughs> a lot of training, and all my training was around uh, science, right? And diagnosis and physical exams and what's the last protocol and the last medication. And nobody told me that uh, my you know, intelligence was not only <laughs> how, how good is my memory and the things that I learned, but that there was an aspect of emotional intelligence that I was supposed to build. And, and I never had the chance. I never heard that word, emotional intelligence, probably until three, four, five years ago when I was above 40. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is scary. Especially if you are working with others, and especially if you are a servant leader, right? And you are exposing your yourself, your physical and your emotional health every day when you are helping others. So what what was your story? Because you know, as people heard before, you know, we were, I was talking about you know being a mental health ally, a wellness advocate. You're part of the national wellness and professional. So you've clearly embraced the other parts of you. What what happened? What changed? So I believe that many things. Uh, first of all, I had the opportunity to reassess my life when I came to this country 11 years ago. I, I came because I, I got married. <laughs> it's a romantic story. I was dating someone here in the US. Uh, well, I was in Lima, Peru, and we were back and forth. And one day he proposed. And finally, I am quitting my job via Skype, right? And surprising oh my, my parents with a wedding that we're preparing for weeks. Uh, so uh, suddenly he asked me, it's like, what do you want to do here? Uh, because well, you can choose whatever you want, or you have to start from zero anyway, so decide. And I decided to go exactly with the same. So I became exactly the same type of physician with the same specialty. And then when I finished my training, I went to uh, work uh, in academia. That was exactly what I was doing before. So I had the luck to be able to reassess who I am several <laughs> decades later. And I found that this represents me. But now I was doing this with a big belly when I was running in the hospital <laughs> uh, for 30 hour call and then uh, breast pumping and having a second baby coming. And, and you realize at that point that yes, it, my career was very important, but now I have extra baggage, right? <laughs> and I cannot Sorry, the alarm. And I cannot do things in the same way. Now I have two beautiful boys and I have one waiting for me. And now I have to find this balance that everybody talks about. And I have my issues with the board. Um, and that was a moment to, you know, ask what is my priority? Yeah. And then COVID was the last drop. And COVID showed me and many of us that. Uh, life was beyond you know work and uh, um, certificates and money and many other things that if you don't have health and you don't have people that love you and that you love uh, no matter what else do you have mm -hmm. and my kids suffered through COVID and I had my parents um, elderly people living in Peru for two years oh, wow. and I was not able to see them mm -hmm. and yes I had my white coat very yes. helpful, mm -hmm. but not for that personal aspect of my life. Yeah. And that was difficult to, you know, to swallow. <laughs> yeah. And so you found yourself at these two crossroads. One, when you had kids, right? Which I know our training backgrounds are, are somewhat different medical school and graduate school, but I don't think either programs are set up for women and moms. Um, and then another reassessment, an even deeper reassessment with COVID. Yes, um, and in between that, uh, I believe that something that happened to me that pushed me uh, really uh, was the fact that when I got my academic job, um, 
the person that was my my um, the leader of the program uh, had a different opportunity and he kind of left me <laughs> in a position that well, I was not ready for. Oh. Um, many will take this as a, a amazing moment, right? To reach a high position um, and to have it in their CVs for me was a very challenging moment because I realized that I had the responsibility of 45 residents that were supposed to be trained appropriately and then all the lives that they will be touching mm -hmm. you know the rest of their lives so multiply this is a logarithmic effect and, and I didn't feel ready uh, at that point for that challenge and that's the reason why I got into this leadership academy and fellowship that I did so so it was just my my need of finding a way to do my job in a better way. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful because that was the first time that I heard emotional intelligence, self-awareness, leadership, and those words that you assume that a physician should know since they won, mm -hmm. and that I never heard in Peru or here with, you know, with all the diploma that I was collecting. You. And so it just, it changed being in a different area of leadership and wellness and emotional intelligence. How did it change you as a physician? It changed me not only as a physician, it changed me as a person uh, because first of all, I have this uh, idea that you cannot be a good physician if you are not a good person. Mm. I, I cannot disconnect those, right? So um as a physician, I believe that as a physician per se, it didn't change me so much because I have been, for some reason, a caring physician since day one. That, that was my way to connect with people. So I was practicing some of these things already without knowing what I was doing, but mm -hmm. it empowered me to continue being the way I was and at this point to teach my residents, my medical students, the, the same concepts, mm -hmm. but now based, you know, of, in science, based on other experiences, based on the literature. So I, I was able to understand what I was doing and, and to trans, transfer this to others. Uh, but I feel like in, in it impact more my academic and my administrative role and my leadership position role, because I discovered that to be a good leader is not enough to be a good physician or even a good person. Uh, and I feel that that's the big problem in this country and many other countries, right? That we are picking individuals for some of their amazing things that they are doing in their current roles. Agree. But not taking in consideration that they are not ready to assume a leadership, administrative, or academic role. And the gap is big. It's like, now you have to do something that you have no clue how to do. Mm -hmm. And if you don't develop those new skills that sometimes they are called soft skills, and I, I, I'm glad that someone changed that name to fundamental skills. I believe that is more <laughs> fair right now. <laughs> Uh, if you don't develop those skills, uh, you really will fail. And when you fail in a leadership position, you make everybody else around you fail. I, I absolutely agree. You know, I work with a lot of healthcare organizations and people who are maybe wonderful physicians or wonderful medical assistants or wonderful nurses. And then they're put into a role of leadership for their team, for their, their department, because they were really good at their job, but they're not given any leadership skills or support to be able to have tough conversations, inspire their team, direct and delegate. And so then what ends up happening is these people who were fabulous in their job now feel overwhelmed and alone. And so I love that you're speaking truth to that, Miriam, because, you know, if we're going to move people up, whether it's in medicine or any organization, we have to support them. We need to support them and we need to uh, prepare them before. It's not only to support them during the time that they are already leaders. The idea is to be able to select them uh, because of the skills that they have. Or if we see that they could develop these skills, that they have this, you know, uh, I don't know, something there that we uh, feel like uh, they will 
fit that role or that they belong to that role. So we need to give them the education, right? This is something that we can train on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sadly, this concept that you, you come to the world with or without certain skills, especially the personal skills, that's, that's not a reality. Big part is something that we can develop. Um, in adulthood, but but even more important, right? And and we were talking about kids before uh, we started the, this this recording, right? I believe that we need to focus right now in the young generation. We need to focus on kids because they are sponges. They 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 can you know get this in their body and in their brains easier than us. And we need to start really preparing the new generation of leaders at school. Mm -hmm. For us, it's more complex. For me, I have to admit, and I admit this in my book too, uh, and it has been kind of my goal to be very transparent and very vulnerable, even mm -hmm. for me as a physician and as a type eight and everything else. Uh, oh my goodness, it has been so painful, right? To admit that I am not perfect. I don't have super powers, right? And I don't know everything. So, oh my goodness, my ego is... <laughs> hurting uh, but a uh, big part of my goal is to be transparent and and come emotionally naked right and present myself the way I am for good or for bad and and try to transmit this this important message that we need to be self-aware we need to be able to recognize our gaps and that's awesome because that means that we have the opportunity to grow and to learn and to change and to improve, right? And to become role models for the next people that is, you know, going through the same. We all are imperfect because we are all humans. That's part of it. I mean, that that's completely different, I think, than how you're trained, right? <laughs> On this podcast, you know, we're talking to physicians and healthcare providers around, you know, trauma um, and part of what you're saying is that the cure or the antidote to being tra traumatized, being overwhelmed, um, feeling burned out is to be vulnerable, to be transparent. I mean, I imagine that somebody listening is hearing you say that and thinking, wait a second, in order to feel less overwhelmed, I'm supposed to be more vulnerable, more like, you know, recognize, like, what would you say to them if they're like, this is crazy, that's terrifying. I will say that I am not in drugs right now. I am not having hallucinations. <laughs> <laughs> I will disclose that. Uh, no, the truth is that, yes, looks like a uh, contradictory, right? It's like we were trained, again, in many careers, uh, we were trained in the world, right? That's how we grow up, grew up, thinking that we need to have this phase of nothing affects me, I am super strong. And this was even more important for women, right? Uh, in leadership positions, we need to look like we know what we are doing. And, and if we are a little even like mean, even better, you look to look, you look, look, you need to look like you are mean and you are serious and you are, oh, you know, not true. Uh, we are supposed to be women. Being a woman means that we will have some skills that men don't have, and that will give us some ability that they don't have, and we will be able to add to this delicious cake of life some things that they don't have. So we don't need to become men to be good yeah. women leaders. Yes. And I believe that that's important yes. to know and to admit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that nobody told us when we were kids. Mm -hmm. We were told you need to look like a guy, right? And act like a guy so you can get their position. No, I don't want their position and I don't want to look like them. I want to be me mm -hmm. and do things in my way and to collaborate. I am not against guys. I am not a feminist, you know. <laughs> I am just a realistic person and that I understand that we will not make this world better if we don't collaborate. And we don't use this beautiful concept that is uh, not only diversity, but also inclusion, right? Where we accept everybody and we include them and we appreciate the, you know, little ingredient that they have for this amazing cake that we want to 
create. Oh my God. And that's number mm -hmm. one. And, and number two is the fact that living a life that is a fake life mm -hmm. and using a mask or makeup every day is painful and it's difficult. It's like being a clown daily. Wow. Uh, and so you already have a life that is challenging mm -hmm. and you add to that the challenge of faking that you are happy and life is wonderful and everything is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And you have all these powers that you don't have. So you have now no one backpack, you have a double backpack mm -hmm. and it's heavy. The yeah. day that you remove that mask and this fake behavior and this fake, you know, concept of trying to be perfect when you are not, uh, not only that you, yes, you become more vulnerable and that could be a scary, yes, mm -hmm. but you become more real mm -hmm. and you become someone that will not have to fake. So you don't have to double think what you are doing. You are just being natural. So one of the backpacks is gone. And this has a ripple effect in two ways. One is for you, because at the moment that you are vulnerable, you will admit not being perfect and you will admit that some things you can fix by your own, but there are some things that you need to ask for help yes. in order to, and, and you are going to this, you know, different way to do things where you get the help at the moment that you need and, and you don't go in this, you know, snowball process where you know that this will explode at some point mm -hmm. and will affect you, your career, your family and, and everything else. Mm -hmm. So that's one, that's what happened with vulnerability to you. But what happened with vulnerability to others, which is very interesting, mm -hmm. is that you are setting a new type of example and expectations. Absolutely. I will tell you my story. I used to be this happy person and that's my personality really. I don't need to fake it, but I will try to cover the, you know, dark spots here and there uh, to make life for others better and simple, more simple. Uh, during COVID, when I was not able to use my nice dresses and high heels, and of course I was not able to use makeup either. I was looking like an astronaut kind of, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, that that helped me to also remove the mask of my soul, oh. right? Which was very interesting. I, I didn't do it on purpose. I will never get credit for that because I don't deserve it. It happened. It was just there, right? I felt like, okay, if I'm not using makeup, I don't need to fake that I am happy. It's COVID time. I'm miserable, That's right? Awesome. And I, I started to go to the clinic and share how miserable I was feeling. Not in a negative way, but tomorrow, in the, today in the morning was a disaster. My kids were destroying my house. One was crying because he thinks that I will die and I have to come here and I am afraid of what will happen. Yes. And my residents and my staff used to think that, I mean, I was losing control, which probably I was kind <laughs> of, right? Uh, but weeks later, I was surprised to start seeing staff and residents coming into my office mm -hmm. uh, where I normally have chocolate and fun music and, you know, look like uh, very homey. Uh, and they will start sharing their own situations. And some of them will start even crying. Yes. And I hear a mama here. So if, if we have someone coming, uh, and just, you know, preparing you guys, we may have some, <laughs> some here. And what happened is that I discovered that my vulnerability was having this ripple effect and kind of this butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. Wait a second, puppy. I'm in camera right now. Oh, so you can say hello or you can be quiet, whatever you want. And there is a hand say hello. <laughs> yes, as a guest so, <laughs> so what happened is that the truth is that this butterfly effect allow others yes. to be vulnerable to and to ask for help. So when we are vulnerable, in some way we are giving permission to others to be non-perfect 
mm -hmm. to be afraid, to ask for help, and to be humans. Yeah. And if, that could save lives. It could, oh, oh my gosh. I mean, if we operationalize it, I wrote down here like that vulnerability leads to validation for people, which leads to really creating space that can change what people are sharing with you, which you're absolutely right, can, can change lives. Hi, I buddy. Love. <laughs> you want to say hello? How are you? Um, Miriam, tell us about your book. Tell us about the, the three, the three G and, and how this is related to the work you've done around wellness and what your hope is for people who read it. So the treatment cycle started really as a very personal journey trying to escape burnout. It came to my life in, during the right moment. I was quitting my job and uh, because it didn't fit my values anymore. Uh, and I was very lost at that point. And I was asking myself if I was doing the right thing, if I was, I, I quit my love, my, my job without having any plan. Like I quit, very mm -hmm. crazy. But um, at that point I saw <laughs> kind of a message in LinkedIn from someone that I didn't know, someone saying congratulations to someone else, to someone else. And I pay attention and the opportunity of writing a book was there and I, I click it. Um, so I joined this program, the Creators Institute program from your son university that for me is kind of a fellowship where they help us to learn how to write a book and kind of the end, right, is you publish your book. And I thought, okay, this could be amazing because now I will be busy. I will use my experiences uh, maybe to help others. And most important, I will be, you know, venting out everything that they have inside of me because it has to go out. Yeah. Uh, um, I was already doing advocacy uh, through podcasts and articles on uh, social media, trying to advocate for physician well-being and etc. So it, it fit amazingly at that point. Yeah. Uh, what happened with this experiment uh, that was supposed to save me and <laughs> my mental well-being is that it ended being a collective journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, I really love you, but I believe that you need to go out <laughs> right now. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And uh, what happened is that I discovered that I needed help to write this book. Mm -hmm. and that uh, the best way to do it, it was to collect the experiences of others. Mm -hmm. uh, and I started interviewing experts on, on different areas. And what is interesting is that I thought that this book was for physicians. And you will give me three seconds right now. <laughs> okay, so what I did is I, I started writing and I discovered the many gaps that I had in my life. It's like, okay, how do I, you know, select what is good or not for me? What is my, my purpose? What is success for me? What, what's the life that I am living and, and, and how do I fix it? Okay, uh, you are the psychologist right now. Uh, what, do I, what do I do? <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I, I will call, I will call your friend. And she's not paying for flavor, so you decide. Yes, I know that she hear me. And the mom of Rafa will hear me too. So please go down, okay? I love you, but no now. This is the world of, of Zooming and, and COVID and parenting right now. Just having kids in our meetings and in our lives. <laughs> I, I'm just lucky my kids are at school right now. You're in the middle of, of a hurricane, so don't apologize. <laughs> I am literally in the middle of a hurricane. The Absolutely. hurricane is inside of my house. <laughs> um, so going back to the book. So what I did is trying to close my own gaps. I asked for help. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that asking for help, as I discovered with the fact of being vulnerable, really is not something that shows how weak you are, but show how strong you are. Yes. Big, big discovery for me. This was like, 
Mm -hmm. And the people that I found that this was all through LinkedIn. So I have to say thank you to LinkedIn. In this, <laughs> um, I found you was through LinkedIn as well. Yes, yes. LinkedIn saved my life too, <laughs> to be sincere, <laughs> during COVID and etc. Um, the truth is that what I discovered is that these gaps were able to be closed. Mm. Uh, that asking for help was showing how strong I was because I was able to admit my gaps, right? And admit my imperfections. And for, for our ego, uh, that is very painful. Mm -hmm. um, and then after you admit those and you go to others and ask for help, that's a second level of, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> of, of painful moments where you have to show others that you are not perfect. But the truth is that when you are able to say that there is another package that you are throwing, you feel less heavy. Mm -hmm. And that's the moment that you start healing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love this idea of the more of that work that you do around, you know, vulnerability and self-reflection and realizing where the gaps are, you're literally removing baggage. You're literally taking off the weight of perfection and being, you know, uh, someone who knows everything all of the time. It's just, it's an incredible, an incredible gift. Um, and we can call it odd. We can call this, and I will, maybe it's the first time that I'm saying this, and I don't know if someone said this before. Uh, maybe this is a new concept uh, we are creating here in your program, but it's kind of the onion effect. Yeah. You yes. are removing layers yes. and you are crying during the process mm -hmm. because it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Not easy. And Absolutely you're ready, not easy. right? As you shed those layers, you find out more about yourself. And yet it's really, it sounds like for you has been an incredibly beautiful awakening process. And yes, beautiful in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say traumatic in many others, mm -hmm. uh, painful, embarrassing, uh, amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe that this you remove layers and what you are allowing is to show real emotions. Uh, because what I discovered during this process, and, and probably it's something that uh, hopefully will change my future life forever, is that I hear more voices now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my famous kid, the one that is joining us right now. Um, and. The, the truth is that what I learned also, uh, and this is something that I need to credit uh, Brene Brown because mm -hmm. I learned this from her, mm -hmm. is that when you are living your life trying to shut up your feelings, right, with this idea of protecting yourself from these negative emotions, uh, what we are doing is numbing ourselves for everything else. Absolutely. And I can tell today that yes, I was very good trying to numb myself at the beginning. So I was not affected by the suffering of my patients, right? This secondary trauma. I was trying to protect myself from secondary trauma to be kind with them and, and give them hugs because that's the way I am a physician. Same with my students, but at the same time, it took me to a moment where I was numb, really, to almost everything. Still, I was kind. It's not that you yeah. stop being kind. Don't, don't, it's not that you become became someone rude or nasty. No, that's not. And that's the problem, that it is still so subtle that you, you don't realize that it's happening, right? Just kind of uh, ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And suddenly, I was in a room, even watching my kids, doing cool stuff, funny stuff, right? And Indeed. I was able to, and I was not able to enjoy it completely. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a problem because I was numb and I didn't know, I didn't notice it. Mm -hmm. So today my big fight is to try to awake myself from that numbness. Can you do that? And, and to start, Allowing myself, I will call you, I promise. Uh, I'm so sorry again. And I will, I'm, I'm 
fighting with myself and with the training that I went through and to, to the life that I used to live, trying to find this equilibrium in how much I can open the doors of my heart for feelings mm -hmm. and when I need to close it a little so I don't get hurt uh, to become the person that I want to be mm -hmm. and the mother that I want to be mm -hmm. and you saw my two little monsters here my beautiful boys and and they deserve a better mom mm -hmm. and they deserve a better life mm -hmm. So it's been a beautiful process and a hard process and a sad process. And, and I think that's the work, right? That's the work for all of us to become more self-aware and of the stuff that we're carrying around so that we can learn how to lay some of it down sometimes and, and be our more authentic selves. That's, that's really, I'm hearing you talk about just peeling back the layers to authenticity. Yeah, and I recommend it, and I recommend it even will be painful, and I recommend it even it will be difficult, and it will not happen, you know, magically uh, in one day. I'm going through it, uh, and, and, and that's again part of my transparency in any podcast or during the book. I, you will not hear me saying I know how to do this, mm -hmm. because the truth is that I am learning how to go through this new Miriam that I am creating. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I will make mistakes for sure. And I have very good days where I am proud because I did the meditation sessions that I was planning to. And I have days that I am like running around, uh, you know, like a chicken without head trying to find out what, what is my purpose, what I was supposed to do today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you know what? That is okay. Yeah. Yes. That is okay. The, the question is not, how many times you will fall down, right? And this is some kind of cliche, but it's so real. It's like, are we self-aware enough? Are we self-compassionate enough? Are we able to love ourselves in the way that we are enough to mm -hmm. forgive our failures? And I don't know if failure is the right word. It's so negative, right? Our moments of weakness or our moments of you know getting lost and right. recover ourselves stand up again have the strength to do it ourselves or with the help of someone else mm -hmm. and then keep going i i'm just sitting here listening and i am imagining young residents who might be this or young physicians and i just I remember being a young graduate student and just wishing I had a mentor like that who, who would tell me exactly what you're saying right now, which is we're going to mess up and we're going to fall down. And that's not the important part. The important part is how do you get up and, and embrace those, those shortcomings or those things that are just make you human, right? We're, we're just human. We're going to, to mess up. So this is, this is a, a good um, kind of uh, um, segue into our, our wrapping up our podcast. I have a couple just like what I call rapid fire questions, if you will. Okay. So <laughs> um, what's one thing that people get wrong about physicians? Uh, that we are superheroes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We yeah. are not. <laughs> I know you've said some of this already, but just to reiterate, if you could go back um, back to young Dr. Z in Peru, what would you tell her? Do not procrastinate to live your life, to enjoy your life, to find love, mm. to get married, to have kids. Mm. You don't need to stop one part of your life to be able to achieve the other. Yes, yes. Um, if, if, if you're listening, you can't see this, but I think both Miriam and I are pretty tearful right now. It's <laughs> a hard balance, right? Allowing ourselves to be the professionals we've trained to be and the moms and wives that we want to be also. Um, yeah. Um, so often in healthcare, I think people get intimidated by physicians, by professionals, right? Um, by the white coat, as you were saying. <laughs> um, will you share with the listeners one thing that makes you what I call a messy human or one thing that makes you perfectly imperfect? Oh, I, 
I mean, you will have to stay with me for two hours for that one. But I will tell you something uh, that I believe that will be probably funny, uh, but completely true. I hate needles. I'm oh. terrified, terrified of needles. And I used to faint in front of not only blood, but even meat to the point that I am vegetarian because I was not able to see the meat on the supermarket. Oh my gosh. And it took me a lot of effort to convince my parents to allow me to go to medical school under the circumstances of that I will probably faint day and night during my training. Uh, yes. Oh my so God. Now I don't faint. <laughs> I'm just scared of the needles. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So if you're scared of you have needle phobia with Dr. Z, you're not alone. <laughs> okay. Last question. It's the hardest one. Um, it's 11 p.m. at night and you have a food craving. What do you reach for? Oh, that doesn't have to be 11. It could be any time of the day, any day of the year. Chocolate. <laughs> Are you milk chocolate or white chocolate club? I like actually dark chocolate. Dark chocolate. Oh my <laughs> gosh. I love it. I love it. Um, Miriam, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. I, I can't even tell you so many things that you shared today. Your vulnerability, um, I really think that's how we're going to transform medicine and healthcare is allowing ourselves to be full humans. And so I think about the the, you were saying 45 residents that you train at any given time, and I'm sure hundreds over the years. And um, even people that are listening, you are a light. Um, and this work is important and hard. And so thank you so much for, for sharing your vulnerabilities. I really appreciate you. Thank you. And I, I, I mentioned this to you before, and I will repeat it now. Uh, I appreciate what you are doing and to allowing uh, us to share who we are as human beings and to uh, help us to all build resilience. Uh, and even more, I believe that what we need to build is actually grow, right? We need to grow during adversity, after adversity, and besides adversity. We need to understand that as physicians or any other individual that works serving others, we will go through the trauma, not only that affects us directly, but the trauma that we witness every day. And that if we are not nice with ourselves and we don't take care of ourselves, uh, we will not be able to do what we have been dreaming to do, right? How you can help someone else if you are not okay? And that's a, a very deep question that many of us as healthcare workers in general were never asked. Uh, and we need to start doing it because if we want to help others, if we want to save lives, if we want to be good physicians, nurses, psychologists, counselors, physical therapists, and good people, good parents, good spouses, good daughters and siblings, and etc., we need to start taking care of ourselves first. Very difficult. But I want to clarify something. Even we are in careers that are very close to altruism. Uh, and we have been told that an altruistic person has to give even their life to others. Mm -hmm. There is not life to give if you don't have one. Mm -hmm. And there is not a contradiction of taking care of yourself in order to be altruistic. Mm -hmm. Actually, taking care of ourselves is a responsibility yes. because we are deciding life and death every day. Mm -hmm. We are deciding well-being or disaster every day. Mm -hmm. So being responsible means being professional, and both of them require from us to be the 100% that we need to be, oh. and that means self-care. Okay, I, I think we could like just bottle the last two minutes of what you said and put it on repeat over and over and over in every physician's lounge and every <laughs> Miriam. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. I really appreciate what you are doing. And I hope that today we are changing a little those chips that we had introduced in our minds uh, for better now. Me too.